side in here. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Sorry for the delay. Had a little problem connecting to the room, uh, but we're all set here. You should be able to hear okay. All right. You should be able to see the screen okay. Uh, we're looking at uh, six charts of the Aussie. I'm sorry, five charts of the Aussie, one chart of the uh, U.S. dollar index, and you should be able to hear okay. Camera's good. Yeah, again, sorry for the short delay. Um, had a little trouble getting in the room. Uh, had to uh, a, a new hard drive installed in this computer not long ago. Not long ago, ago. So I think uh, all the settings were were uh, were not saved like they usually are. Anyway, let's get started. So today we're going to go over some some rules around short-term trading in the forex market. We almost always spend time on the spot forex market, so, so I thought today, uh, since we do that often and since most of the recordings that you might be viewing, if you look at any of the recordings, are in the spot market, I thought we would change it up for your benefit and spend most of our time looking at the futures, the currency futures. Okay. Uh, Philippe, we'll, we'll get to that question and a bunch more in just a minute. So we'll, we'll spend a, uh, a lot of our examples and learn lesson time today and, and application time looking at the Forex futures. It's a really great way to go when it comes to short-term trading. So it works well with today's topic. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, instead of directly just answering those questions, uh, Philippe, uh, Aviator, and, and anyone else, um, we'll, uh, let, me, let me just get started and give you about just, just a two or three minute talk track around the whole supply demand concept and we'll be very clear with you know what we're talking about is are we just talking about support and resistance um, are we just changing names things like that um, and the answer is no but but let me just give you the clear clear beginning to all this and then we'll apply these principles to the short smaller time frames for short-term forex trading purposes okay and uh, and then, um, and I think you'll get it. So we'll go over strategy. Uh, we'll talk about the two most important things, and then we'll look at, uh, and, then, and then we'll, you know, we'll apply this at the same time to the live markets. Okay. So let me uh, just jumped over to the two minute here. I see uh, hold tight is talking about the Canadian dollar. Uh, yeah, that's 65. Oh, I was going to start with the Aussie hold type, but we can certainly do it here. I, I quickly see which level you're looking at. All right. Yeah, so first of all, the reason why um, I, I chose to go with the Forex futures for this short-term uh, Forex trading session is because, in my opinion, it's safer to use the uh, forex futures when it comes to short-term forex trading than it is the spot for the average person and it's easier okay and there's a lot of reasons why so I'm not saying spot forex is impossible in the smaller time frames I'm just telling you from my experience and maybe some people want to weigh in on this here it's, it's easier and safer for you okay so uh, let's start with the whole supply demand concept first of all like anything in life uh, uh, first of all, uh, I keep saying first of all, uh, Nolan Lewis is with us. He's here to help uh, anybody that's interested in joining the Online Trading Academy. But we'll talk, I can talk more about that later on. How you doing, Nolan? He's my colleague, uh, so we kind of work together. Uh, he can help you, and, and if I miss anything, he can, he can certainly help. Uh, so he's here. How you doing, Nolan? Nolan's a great guy. Um, all right, let's begin. When, when, I, when we talk about supply and demand, those are not unique words. Supply and demand is everywhere. There's, there's not a person here that hasn't heard the terms supply and demand before, right? Okay. Um, however, you know, like anything in life, there's the book version way of doing things and the real world way of doing things, okay? And what, what I'm here to share with you is, is what I would consider the real world way of trading, Short term, long term, whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, trader. There are some there are some differences when it comes to forex futures and spot forex. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, um, what I would be very careful with is sticking with the conventional terms of support and resistance. If you think the simple logic through for how the books teach us 
about support and resistance. You're going to find many flaws that end up, you know, end up with, uh, and you're going to end up with, you know, not, not a great, uh, probably not a great track record. Okay, if it was as easy as reading the books and just Googling support and resistance and really mastering those definitions, everybody would be making money. Okay, but that's just not the case. So, um, now where, where you really start to see those flaws and w is when you start to dive into kind of the real world way of doing this. So let me share that with you for just a minute. And as I do, uh, I'm going to, you know, point some things out on the chart. Okay. First of all, um, I did not start out reading a book. I started my career on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange handling institutional order flow in the currency futures, the Forex futures. Okay? Pivot point, same thing, Boyke. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a second, okay? And, and then, and again, um, you know, you're, you're one of the veterans in here, so your opinion is always valued. Uh, but let's, we'll talk about that in just a moment, okay? So if, if you, let, let, let and, and so, so that's, that's my background. That's where I started. What I had in front of me were the market's real willing buyer orders and real willing sell orders. Another word for that, real willing supply and real willing demand which is very different than you see on a computer screen when you're looking at bids and offers, okay? Those are, those are the, you know, the intentions around those orders are not exactly real, okay? There's a lot of bluffing that goes on and this and that, and we'll talk about that later. But let, let's forget about all that for just a moment, okay? Let's forget about just that for just a moment. Keep it real simple. If, if we are in search of, if the only way to really profit from this is low risk to find the lowest risk, highest reward, and highest probability trading opportunity. Well, how's that? Where's that going? Where's that always going to be? Okay, that means entering positions as close to the turn in price as possible, being in for the move in price, and then exiting the position as close to the next turn in price as po possible. Right? Is everybody? Are we all on board with that? Okay. Are we all? Are we all? Uh, uh, pretty much on board with that? Okay, if we are, all right, then, then here's the next question. Where are, how do we find those turns in price? In other words, where do prices turn in any and all markets? Short-term, long-term, stocks, futures, forex, where do they all turn? They turn at price levels where supply and demand are out of balance, correct? Again, I'm trying, you know, the way, you know, what we're talking about here is something that I think we all agree with. I don't think there's anyone that's going to disagree with that, right? And this isn't my thing. This is just how it all works, okay? I'm, just, I'm not saying anything different than Adam Smith said a few hundred years ago, right? The father of uh, modern economics. Anyway, so if we all agree with that, the only remaining question is, what exactly does that picture look like on a price chart? Okay, and that's our focus here today. And that's where it becomes a gray area for most people. Because most people say, well, that picture is support and resistance. Well, be very careful with that. Don't, don't put a dime of your hard-earned money at risk in the market until your definition of support and resistance completely matches the definition of a supply and demand imbalance. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, do what you want. I'm just, I'm just, I'm here for you. But I think you get what I'm saying. Okay. So. If we go with the conventional term support and resistance, we're going to include pivot points. A lot of people are going to include moving averages and Elliott wave points and Fibonacci retracement levels and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, but there, there's, there's massive flaws with, with, with all those things. And let me explain. Okay. Um, uh, Pick any one of the ones I just mentioned. Uh, any of those? Anybody's favorites? Uh, Boyke, yeah. Now, I'll tell you more about that. That's my next thing I'm going to get into. But pick one of those. I just mentioned like five. Uh, pivot points. Chima. Okay. Pivot points. Is that what you're pointing out there? Okay. Excellent. So let me, uh, let me just hit that one. Okay. So pivot points. Right. The reason why I would not just look at a pivot point as a support or resistance level is because a pivot point is a move into an area and a move out of an area already, correct? Do we all agree with that? So again, I go back to my experience having real institutional orders in front of me. Every time you come, you return to a 
demand level, a price level where willing demand exceeds willing supply, what's happening to that amount of demand? Is it increasing or decreasing? Okay. Right? It was decreasing. Yeah, and gold, uh, I agree with you there. Okay. It was decreasing. So I would never just buy, blindly buy a pullback to a pivot point because I already know that there's less willing demand or supply in that level. Someone else wrote Fibonacci retracement levels. Let's just talk about that one and then we'll, we'll move on with supply and demand. The problem with Fibonacci, Fibonacci levels is if you're looking at retracement levels, you always have five different numbers on your chart. Okay? All right. All right, five different numbers on your chart. So the question for us is, which one do we buy the pullback to or sell the rally to? Which one, right? Well, um, you know, how do you choose? If you, if you, you know, with the, the, the Fibonacci line that prices are always going to turn at is the one that also lines up with the real supplier demand level to the left. If you, if you look, you'll, you'll notice that. So after doing that for a while, you're going to say, well, wait a second. If I'm only taking the line that lines up with real supply or demand, why do I need all these other lines on the chart? You see what I'm saying? And yet pip runner, the pivot point, yeah, days high, low, and close divided by three. Think about that calculation right there, okay? The, you know, what does that have to do with real supply and demand in the market? Okay, not much. All right, so, so if you're going to use any of those things, at, at the very least, make sure they line up with the real levels we're going to learn today. Okay, uh, but I think after time, and there's there's a there's a number of people in our session here today that I think that are in our in our program already, and, and some that aren't that are doing well, that will tell you that the the answer that your the conclusion you're going to come to is price and price alone, and really focusing on the picture that represents real willing supply, real willing demand. So let me go back to what I did. One more minute on this story, and then we'll move on to the charts. Um, what, 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 what I did uh, were, were, was, was before I, you know, when I, when I knew I didn't want to be on the trading floor anymore and I wanted to, you know, do this from home, which I spent, a, which I spent uh, quite a bit of my time in my 20s and uh, a decent amount of time in my early 30s just doing this from home, okay, or I should say all my 30s. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I don't know how old I am right now. I'm 40, uh, 40 years old. Yeah, I'll be... 41. I'm 41. I'll be 42 uh, next year. Amazing. All right. Uh, yeah, so you're, you're looking at a chart here. Let me just grab the chart again. Okay. Um, so what I spent my time doing was every morning I would grab a chart of the markets I was watching. Maybe it was the yen. It was usually the yen, the pound and uh, the Swiss, maybe the Canadian. I was always in front of the yen pit at the, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but I, you know, I worked all the other pits as well. But I'd bring a chart over to the desk, and in front of me, to my left, I'd have the big buy orders, and to my right, I'd have the big sell orders. And if I want to know where price was going to stop falling and turn higher, okay, I would look down into my left and, and find the largest stack of buy orders below current price. That was the market's real willing demand, right? Want to know where the market was going to stop rallying and turn lower? Look down to my right and find the largest stack of sell orders above current price. That was the market's real willing supply. So what I would do in the morning is I'd put lines around those levels on a chart and let the day pass. And sure enough, price would just bounce from level to level. Okay. All right. Excellent, uh, Gold. So what what is that age? Is that is that forty? Never heard that before, but uh, I'm, I'm 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 trying to pass the test. We'll see. Okay. Uh, all right, so, um, uh, and you know what, on the other side, I see some of the comments, you know, this is what I've spent uh, outside of, you know, some of the uh, some of the, some of the other things I like to do as far as career, this is what I've done pretty much my whole life. So, you know, uh, you do it this long, you better be, you know, pretty decent at it. You know, like, uh, you know, I watch baseball, and I'm not a big baseball fan, and I watch I watch football and all these other sports and the pros and everything, and yeah, I'm pretty impressed. But you know what? They should be good at what they do. That's all they do. You know, same uh, same with me. I mean, that's, that's all I've done. You better be good at it now, or something's wrong. Anyway, let's move on. So, what exactly does that picture look like on a price chart? Okay, let's go. Let's go to the Canadian here. Okay, and I want to draw. Uh, I want to draw this level in and really explain it in a detailed. Uh, in a detailed way here, okay. 
I'm going to just draw a box around this level. And if prices pop up here, I, I may be interested in taking this trade. Maybe it'll hit during our session. Maybe it won't. And I'm doing it on a little two-minute chart. Okay. And I'm kind of fast-forwarding here, but I'm going to go back and um, explain all this. Don't worry. Okay. So th this is not a uh, a quality opportunity for for the simple reason that price is just basing under this level. But 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 let's take a look at the supply level here. Okay. Prices were trading here, and then uh, prices declined in fairly strong fashion. Just a little two minute chart. Okay. So, but but ask yourself why did price why was price not able to stay here? Okay. And why did price decline away from that area. It's simply because supply exceeds demand at this level. Don't worry about news or anything else. Keep it very simple. Okay. There's another reason why I'm not super excited about this trade. Um, what we're going to go over in a few minutes is are uh, the two most important things to identifying a setup, location and structure. Uh, this one's a little shaky on both. Um, actually, let me just go over to the Aussie. Let me start with the Aussie. I think this will be better because the Aussie's uh, given us a, a little better opportunity. Let me blow, blow this chart up here. Okay. So as you can see in the larger time frames, um, location-wise, let me grab the chart here. You can see on the daily chart down here that I'm pointing to, yeah, and I would just, I, you know, I would just, remember, I started out on a trading desk, which was, you know, right outside of the pits, which, in my opinion, was a much, uh, it was much more advantageous to do that than start in the pit, because the people in the pit, most of them didn't use charts. They were just trying to scalp a tick here, a tick there, and at the end of the day, if they made more than they lost, they were happy, right? Okay. Um, so, let's see. Take a look at this chart here, the Aussie. Okay. Uh, prices were trading here for a short period of time, and then a massive decline away from that level. All right. Why did this decline happen? Simply because supply exceeds demand at the origin of that drop. Right. Now, notice I drew my lines. I I, I highlighted the meat of the supply. I don't care about these wicks on the bottom. I do care about the wicks on the top. But but I've got the meat of the supply here. Okay. Price fell away from this level. And, and how do I know what the supply-demand equation is here? Is there a small imbalance or a big imbalance? Well, we can ask ourselves some questions. How did prices leave the level? You know, if it was a strong drop in price from the level versus a gradual decline in price, yeah, that suggests a bigger imbalance here. Okay? How far did prices move away from the level before returning back to the level? That's another thing that... that kind of gives us a big clue as to how much supply is here, where the real willing supply is in this market. How much time did price spent here? Was there a lot of time or a little time? You know, just a short period of time is more ideal. So there's lots and lots of things we can look at that, that really help us quantify supply and demand in a market just by looking at price versus, um, you know, adding a bunch of indicators and things like that, right? Okay. So the two most important things, okay, I'm going to draw this on here. This is a larger time frame we're looking at, okay. So I'm going to draw uh, this, I'm going to write this in. But the two important things we want to pay attention to are location on the bigger time frame and then structure on the smaller time frame when we're short-term trading, okay. So a time frame this big, we're going to focus on location. So obviously in the bigger picture, um, in the bigger picture, you know, larger time frame, we're way up near supply. This is a 240-minute chart, okay? And on the daily chart down here, we've rallied quite a ways, and we're right into this big supply area here. So the odds are with the shorts up here, not the longs, okay? So actually, let me, let me just do it this way. I think this will be more helpful. There's the three things you really want to, you know, focus on are, Location, structure, and profit uh, zone or profit margin. Profit zone. Let's go profit zone. Okay. All right. These, these are the three things. Location, 
meaning where are we, where is price in relation to larger time frame supply and demand? That's key. That, the, that answers the question, should we be looking for short-term longs or short-term shorts? Structure. When we come down and find a small time frame level, let's see if we have anything on this, on this Aussie. Uh, let me just kind of scrunch this up a little bit and move this around. Um, I don't see a great level in here. Let me just let me just uh, go to a different time frame here. You know, we look at the small time frames. You know, just uh, well, here's something down here. I don't see a quality supply level above at the moment. But but for structure. Um, take a look. Here's a little level. Oh, let's go back to um, let's go back to our Aussie. That was a, you know, that was structure-wise, it was okay. But structure, what we're talking about with structure is quality of the level, right? Um, let me go back to our Canadian here real quick, okay? And go back to a two-minute. So structure-wise. That's not a bad level. Small period of trading, strong move away from that level. Okay. Um, so structure of, of, of the level, meaning what's the quality of level with those odds enhancers we talk about sometimes. If you don't know what the odds enhancers are, Again, we go over some of them in the recordings, all of them obviously inside the, the Online Trading Academy program, the trading rooms. Um, but how did prices leave the level? How much time did price spend at the level? Um, how far did prices move away from the level before returning back? Is it a fresh level? You know, that's key. All those things are under structure. The third item, which is absolutely key, you have to have all three of these, is profit zone. Okay, so. What I mean by that is this. Take a look at this 240 Aussie again. Okay. So price up into supply with this below. Look at this blue circle I just drew in. Think motion into mass. We've got an overwhelming amount of supply up here in this area. We've got nothing below but clean air. What's the path of least resistance for price at this point? What's the path of least resistance, up or down? Okay. Um, yeah, it's down, right? Okay. You've got, think about it. Pretend, just, you know, close your eyes for a minute. Pretend you're on the trade desk. Right in front of you at current price or close to current price, you have a massive amount of sell orders, a huge stack of paper in front of you. Okay. And when you look to see where the demand is, it's not till like way down here at 9,800, right? Okay. Can you now see why it was illegal for me to trade my own account on the trade desk? Does everybody understand that? Okay. Because I can see the orders here and the orders here and all this room in between, right? You can't lose when you have that information. So what I'm showing you is is what that picture looks like on a price chart. Make sense? Okay. All right, let's uh let's take a look here. Um what I wanted to go to was show you a just want to show you something uh real quick. And uh, we'll go back to the Forex charts in just a minute, but I just want to show you a real trade. You know, we've had some good trades in here the last few sessions. I want to show you a trade that I took uh, this morning, okay? Uh, and this is not the prettiest level. And I'm not saying that I would expect uh, new people to identify this at home, but if let me show you this morning in the S&P. Notice prices were trading up here around 1194. Does everybody see that? Okay. At 1194... And all of a sudden, they drop down here. You see how they drop down all the way to almost 90? I'm pointing to this right here. As soon as I saw this drop happen, I said to myself, well, here's where the sell orders are. Here's where supply exceeds demand. If prices rally up to that level, 
I'll be a willing seller there because I know that I have big supply on my side up here. Okay. Yeah, one FX, um, good stuff there. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, that's going to show you an even clearer picture. Okay. So I just shorted right here. Okay. For a move, just a little move down to here. Not a big deal. Okay. Not a real big deal. Um, I think I was risking two points to make four. Okay. Makes sense. Again, prices fell down to here, which means all of this demand here was absorbed in the initial drop in price, right? Okay. So let me let me blow this up and just again, I just want to sh I try to always I want to be as real as possible with you and show you you know as many real trades as we can. And then we'll get back to the currencies. Simon, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Not the prettiest level. I just want to be real with you and show you. Um, it was basically this area right here. And we're going to set up some more trades in just a few minutes in the Forex markets. This this just is area right here. Okay. Remember, I was not in a class or anything. I'm just sitting here doing this. Okay. And the key thing was this drop in price. Okay. So this drop in price here, um, let me just put a little thing around this. So this initial drop in price, obviously price comes down here, which means that any, any demand or buy order sitting here are going to be filled right here, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Obviously you have willing buyers here, you have buy orders. So when prices come down here, those buy orders are going to be filled, right? Therefore, now follow me here, when prices came back up to this level where the sellers are, price was now easily able to drop through this because there's nothing left. All those orders are already filled. They're matched up, right? The sellers and buyers here are matched up, so there's nothing but clean air there. Space, profit zone. So now there's clean air for prices to move down to the next level, when I'm in the trade or when we are in the trade. Does that make sense? Forget candles on the screen and think in terms of order flow because that's all this is. I don't care what market you're trading anywhere on the planet. It's all just buyers and sellers. Okay? Think of it in those terms and think of, you know, what orders are not filled and what orders are filled. If you think of it like that, every, this whole, like, kind of complicated mix of candles becomes a very clear picture. Okay? Yeah, we're looking at a little two-minute chart here, Andrea. And in the bigger time frame, there's there's quite a bit of supply up there. Okay. So anyway, that was uh, that was kind of a little ugly but but profitable um, trade. Uh, let's go back to some currencies. Okay. Now, what time frame you do this on again? Larger time frame for location. Smaller time frame for structure. And obviously that smaller time frame and larger time frame, I use both of those for the, uh, make sure there's a profit margin there. I mean, if you have it on both time frames, you're golden, right? Okay. Yeah, NZ, I will try to pull it up in just a few minutes. I don't know if that was a pivot point or a level, um, but we'll, we'll try to take a look at that. So let's come back to our Canadian dollar. So let's compare, look at this 240 minute chart in the lower left with the two minute chart up here. What's the difference between this op shorting opportunity and, and the one in the Aussie? Okay. What's the, well, somebody try, somebody type that. What's the difference between this one and, uh, and the Aussie? Why is the Aussie better than the Canadian as far as shorting at that two minute supply level? Okay. And Ains, yes, yeah, structure, we mean those, those odds enhancers. Yes, uh, 4X, 4X 1985, exactly. And Pip Runner, yeah. Look at, look at there where this thing is on the larger time frame. Okay. Take a look. So we have a, big picture demand level sitting just below, right? So even though this short, the structure of this supply level on a two minute may look great, Look where it is in the larger time frame. Be careful. You see what I'm saying? We don't want to be shorting 
this, you, you, I mean, this is probably fine, but we don't want to be shorting, you know, right into larger time frame demand, okay? Because the Aussie is the opposite. The Aussie is right into larger time frame supply, okay? Uh, 97.30, what, Jose, what time frame are you looking at for the 97.30? Just so I know what chart to, to look at. Are you talking about this two minute here? You're talking about this pivot low here? Uh, Andrea, what you type there is, is, the, is the perfect scenario. And you're not always going to have that, but when you do have that, you know, go go find times where that doesn't work. That's gonna that's gonna work and be a huge trade most of the time. Okay, you don't have to have that. Just don't short into larger time frame demand or buy into larger time frame supply. Okay, and Jose, again, so you're looking at this level. I would not buy against this over here. This is just a pivot low. Okay, this is this is a move already into kind of the opposite one of these. Makes sense. See what I'm saying? Okay. This supply level is not the opposite of this. Again, it all has to do with those odds enhancers. All right, and again, we go over quite a few of them in here, obviously more in the program, but um, yeah, you don't just want to be buying against pivot highs and pivot lows. Remember, those pivot points are just moves into areas already, okay? Think of this picture, one more thing, and then we'll move on to a different market, okay? And really, really, you know, forget about the charts for a minute. Think this picture through. You've got a big stack of buy orders in front of you. You work at a bank. You work at, I don't know, Saxo Bank, any of them. Any of the biggest bank, Barclays, whatever. You're on the dealer desk. You've got a huge stack of buy orders in front of you and hardly any sellers. You've got a few, few, few sell orders and lots of buy orders. Okay? Few sellers, lots of buy orders. What's going to happen once those sell orders are filled? What's going to happen once all those sell orders are filled? Where's, what's going to happen to price? And really think this picture through. Build this picture in mind. Yeah, yeah, it's going to go up. It has to, right? Okay, it's going to go up. And and it's going to go up until where? Till it hits a price level where supply exceeds demand, right? And you probably got that orders on your those orders on your desk too. So let's say that original demand level is at 9500. So now price is trading up to 9560 and you reach a big supply level, okay? But you but but did all our orders at 9500 get filled? Did we fill all, all our orders there? At 9,500? No. We know that for a fact because prices couldn't stay there and rallied away, right? Okay. Demand exceeds supply. Prices move away. Those orders are not not filled. No, we are certain. We we don't we did not fill those orders. That's why prices moved away from that level. Okay. So we're certain that our orders all our orders did not get filled. Now, so price drops back down to 9,500. Okay. And after all that big decline that that brought it back down to 9,500. Now again, you're you're going to have you know a few sell orders down there. So now the rest of those sell orders are filled, and you still have this massive amount of buy orders at 9,500. What's the next move in price? Up or down? It's going to be up, right? Price is going to go up again. Okay, but what picture has just been created on the chart? Okay, we, we've just come down. There's a, there were a few sellers. You know, because, you know, you just had this big drop in price. There's a few sellers that made a mistake and sold sold after a big drop, right? So what picture was just created on the chart? A pivot low, right? We just had a pivot into that 9,500, okay? But do you see how that pivot low, you know, so when that, when, that, when prices were down to 9,500 again, did our demand increase or decrease? You know, did our demand did our demand increase or decrease? Yeah, it decreased with that pivot low. Exactly. So that's why I would never just blindly buy a pullback to a pivot point. Okay? And let me tell you, most of the numbers that you'll see, support resistance numbers that, you know, the all the websites out there spit out at you as pivot high this, pivot low that, weekly high this, daily low that, that's all those are. Okay? Those are all just numbers. They, that, those, those numbers show you where, you know, typically weaker levels are. Those aren't fresh, fresh levels. Okay. All right. So let, let's uh, let's go on to another market. 
And maybe um, let's take a look at the pound. It's not that we ignore the, the pivots, um, 1FX, okay? I don't ignore them. I, I just, uh, I know that, oh, yeah, NZD. We'll do that one next. I just know that um, if you buy, here's a big thing. If you buy or sell a pullback in price to a pivot point, one thing that you're guaran that's guaranteed is you are not buying uh, that you are not taking the highest probability entry. By definition, you're taking a lower probability entry than you can. You're, you're guaranteeing yourself that you're not taking the high probability trade. Okay? All right, so let's look at uh, the pound here. Uh, and the pound's kind of pound's kind of interesting. Uh, we've just come off this kind of big, let me take a picture of this. Um, there we go. There's there's the pound. And let me just blow up this 240 minute chart so we see kind of where we're at, what we have to work with here. Okay, we've just come off this big, you know, kind of bottom. And now uh, the pound recently hit this little area right here. So let's take a look. And let's see if it's, you know, where we would sell the pound and if it makes sense selling the pound. Whoops. Put that line in. One more line in. Okay. So, first of all, um, take a look. Price is gapped away from this level. Okay. Yeah, and one effect, it's, it's not that we don't want to take those pivots. I'm going I'm to give you the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit it right here, okay? Uh, I'm going to tell you exactly when we, because there's plenty of times we'll buy off those pivots. But here's, here's the key. So, notice price gapped away from that level. What does that tell us about the supply-demand equation here? Small imbalance or big imbalance? It's a big imbalance, right? Uh, Spangly, yeah, it, it does. You don't want a lot of activity over there. Yeah, big imbalance. So now price is shot right up to this level and has fallen quite a bit. And now price is rallying back up to this area. So again, we have this nice, clean profit zone below, uh, which means opportunity to to short, right? Let me just clean this up. Whoops, um, line. There we go. And let me take the picture. Yeah, exactly, Pip Runner. Not a lot of buyers till down here. Okay. Exactly. All right, so um, here's the thing. But don't we have, isn't this what I'm pointing at now, a pivot high? Rally, a little bit of base and a drop? That's a pivot high, right? So should we short against this, or should we just not, because we keep saying, you know, be careful of pivots? Here's the, here's the question you want to ask yourself. How deep did price on this first pullback, okay, how, how deep did price go into this supply level here? Was it a deep retracement or a shallow retracement? Okay, it was very shallow or small, right? So what does that tell us about the supply-demand equation here? Small imbalance or big imbalance? Pretty big imbalance, right? Probably. There, okay, so if, so if that's the conclusion, then I would, I will certainly short a rally into this level again. Okay? But if this pivot high went more than 50% into this level, I'm not going to short against this new pivot high. You see what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not just don't take pivot highs and pivot lows. Take a look, you know, look a little deeper and really quantify the supply and demand equation. That's the key. We already know we have a nice, sizable profit margin below, and I'm peeking up here at the 60-minute, too. There's nothing in there. When I look at this, you know, and that, my mind just goes to, wow, find, just find a low-risk way to get short in this market. Okay. So we've got supply just above, 
and we've got nothing below, okay, so odds are, okay, it's all out the odd, odds are uh, this is going to fall. So how do I find a low-risk way to take advantage of that? I'm going to blow up this chart, maybe put it on a 5-minute chart or 10-minute chart. Let's try to find some supply levels above, okay. And scrunch this up just so just so, so it's not so small. Let me go to a 15, and that way we don't have to scrunch it so much. All right, so this is, a, this is kind of a big, ugly area. Um, let me go down again. I'm sorry. Um, now I'm looking for more of a. I'm looking for this. You see how you right here you had kind of a drop, a little bit of basing, and then a drop, and then we rallied into it. You know, nice entry. I suppose we can maybe short against this here. Okay. Or just or just wait for prices to come up to that 240 level again. Uh, this one I'm drawing in, I'm not in, in love with this. It's not a great level, but there's really the pound isn't isn't showing us anything really clear in the smaller time frames as far as a clean supply level structure wise. So we'll see. I, I'd rather just let prices come back up to the 157.75, okay, which can easily happen for a short back down to 156. Makes sense? Also, take a look at the U.S. dollar. Pound up into supply, U.S. dollar down into some demand. I think you get the point. All right. Yeah, in the smaller time frames right now, there's not a lot of quality setups out there. That's usually not the case. Usually we find some good stuff in here. You know, last session we took a really nice one. Okay. Um, somewhere just above 156, Tiger. Okay, somewhere just above 156. Uh, Boyke, let me take a look. Um, sorry, I missed that. How do you know orders are still at that level? Uh, well, if, if you're talking about the, 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 the part of the, the discussion that we're having now, it's because this first retracement that just created this pivot high here that I'm pointing to was hardly, you know, just barely touched this level and fell. So that's kind of a clue that there's still quite a bit of supply there. Okay. Bef now, obviously, the trade we want to take is the first pullback. That's a very important odds enhancer. Retracements. How many times the price came into the level? <coughs> okay. All right, we only want to get in on that first uh, retracement. Ah, uh, great question, Praveen. We we I cover this a lot with the uh, with the equity index futures, the S and P and such. Okay, um, so yeah, the answer is, and, and Praveen, let me tell you, this is where just people who just trade stocks, this is why a lot of them get killed as day traders, because it'll you know they'll come into uh, uh, you know, a new session thinking a level is completely fresh and it is completely not fresh. You know, a lot of times a Globex session, you'll blow right through that, you know, you'll, you'll chew up that level. Maybe not blow through it, but you'll, you'll chew, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll chew through it, right? You'll use up all that supplier demand. Okay. So, yeah, definitely, um, count, you know, see what happened in the Globex session, the overnight session, and I would certainly count those as pullbacks into levels. Make sense? And, and, and the reality is, the more you just take the time out of the equation, which you can do trading Forex and futures, I think the better. Okay. Yeah, so, and the other thing, Praveen, you know, kind of your comment there, it makes sense. That's what this is all about. Um, and, and what I want to kind of point out is that this is not that, um, difficult, and when I say that, I don't want to make it sound easy, but the point is, if you just use simple logic and focus on what makes sense, your, your, your answers are going to be right there, okay? If you know how to properly buy and sell things in every other part of your life, you already know how to do what we're doing here. That's all we're doing here. I'm just showing you where those retail and wholesale prices are in the, on a chart, okay? That's all. So let me, uh, before we run out of time, I want to go over one more very important uh, key point to all this. Let me go back to this Aussie real quick. Okay, there's another part of the logic that you need to understand, and I know we've gone over it many times, and it's knowing who you're trading with or who you're trading against, who's on the other side of your trade. Think about any business that buys and sells things. 
They, the ones that do well know a lot about their customers, the people they're buying from and selling to. Okay? So, um, that's another thing that I noticed very clear on a trading floor. So when prices come back to this supply level, or, or, you know, any of the others we're finding, who's buying here? Okay? Is it someone who's buying after a rally in price, which is a big mistake and almost guarantees you losses? And is it someone who's buying into a price level where supply exceeds demand? I want to make sure that when I sell short, I'm selling to a buyer who doesn't know what they're doing. And I hate to say it like that because it sounds like a zero-sub game and you're taking money from someone, but that's how, that's how it works, unfortunately. I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't make the rules. You know, if you choose to play in this game, let me tell you, there is a winner and there is a loser, okay? Uh, you don't have to play in this game if you don't want to, but if you do, make sure you understand there is a winner and there is a loser, all right? And let me tell you something else. The winners know exactly what the losers do. The winners can spot a loser on a chart very easily. It's a big part of their strategy, okay? Okay, if I'm selling, I know exactly who I want to sell to, like this morning in the, in the S&P. If I'm buying, I know exactly who I want to buy from, okay? And I hate to say it like that. That's not really my, it's, you know, it's not my character to, to talk like that. But I just, I know there's new people with us here, and I don't want you to lose your money you know, I want you to be successful at this, so I just want to kind of be blunt, because that is how it is, and if anybody wants to, uh, you know, comment on that or elaborate, you know, feel free. Okay. Um, okay, let's look at, um, let's take a look at the uh, New Zealand dollar. Someone wanted to look at that earlier. I did not uh, bring that up. And let's see, daily... Look at the daily chart. Um, okay. All right, there we go. Um, let's take a look. All right, so we're looking at a uh, daily of the uh, uh, New Zealand dollar against the U.S. and a 240. And when you when you look at this, uh, if you look at the daily, you know you, you see kind of see a level right here. All right. I mean, there. You know, you need. Remember, we need at least three candles to make a base. So if I draw a line around this, whoops, because this was the question. If we draw a box around this, okay, um, we've got. I'm going to draw two of them in. This one looks like it. it you know. Uh, okay. Let's see. And then we had another one kind of up here, right? And price kind of went through that. But let's look at let's look at what this looked like on the smaller time frame at the same time. Yeah, I think that Dre, you're talking about this one right up here, right? So let's take a look at that on the smaller time frame. And by the way, you see how price is kind of barely pokes through and, and goes in the other direction here. Um, that's something that goes away quite a bit when you move to the futures. I'm not saying it, you know. Every trade is going to work, but, you know, in spot forex, how many times have you seen price go right, you know, touch your stop or even go a tick past your stop and then go in the other direction? Things like that, yeah, you know, a lot of that goes away when you trade the, uh, the futures through uh, the forex futures. Okay, so so what you want to do, um, where where is this? Hang on a second. Uh, yeah, n um, yeah, Dre, um what you want to do is go to a smaller time frame down here, and you'll see, you know, I'm I, I, I'm just looking at this for the first time, but I'm sure each one of, like, this level and this level, you probably got a decent bounce from uh, both of those. But when you, you know, when you come down to these levels, like these levels that you see on the daily chart here, what my point is, make sure you go over here and see what's on the other side of that. So you might reach one of these levels, but if supply is, is too close, it's not going to work. And let me show you what I mean. So here's a perfect example. And again, not every trade is going to work. That's why we're so focused on the odds and, and, and all that. But you see, it, when price, uh, you know, if I, if I made this 180-minute chart, this is going to be a perfect supply level here. Okay? So when, you know, when price bounces off here, which is probably off of, 
you know, it's probably this bounce right here off of, off some demand. Make sure you look at the big intraday time frames and see what's just above. You still have to have a profit margin. Okay. Yeah, Simon, I agree with you. So make sure you, um, just because price is coming into a good level doesn't mean that there's a trade. Remember that number three. You have to have a profit zone. Because there's plenty of times where you're going to see great levels, but they're too close to each other. You know what I mean? Okay. Does that, does that make sense? And they're just great levels, but you don't have a trade. All right. Um, and Nolan, you might want to put your email address in there too. If anybody's interested in joining us at Online Trading Academy, uh, Nolan, there he is, Nolan at TradingAcademy.com. He always has a limited number of scholarships. If you're looking for a scholarship, Nolan's the one that has those. Um, you can always email him, and there's his Skype number if you're interested. Again, I try to go over as much as I can here, um, but obviously um, there are people that spend a ton of time inside our program, so it wouldn't be fair to them to, uh, uh, well, I think you get the point. I try to, it's a fine line that I try to uh, walk carefully, and hopefully this is all helpful. My email address is in there too. Uh, Boyke and you guys, thanks for your help, and I saw you answered some questions for people. Always appreciate it. And we'll, next session, we'll take this concept a lot deeper. There really weren't a lot of short-term trading opportunities. Uh, most of the markets, like the Euro, are just chopping sideways on the small time frames. So instead of diving into one of those and sitting around, you know, uh, we made today very lesson-based. So again, uh, if you have any questions uh, or need a scholarship to, to join the uh, trading room, um, Nolan's the guy for that. If you have any other questions, send me an email. And uh, again, hopefully this is helpful. Thanks for your time, everybody.